In this final episode of this series, I respond to the criticism that situational psychology has demonstrated that there's no such thing as a stable character, and that any identification of the good with virtue thereby suffers from self-effacement. A moral theory suffers from self-effacement when the wrong sort of thing is asserted as the proper moral motive, when, for example, the reasons offered for a good deed strike us as intuitively insufficient, morally speaking. It's as if we are in hospital and we ask our friend why she visited us, and she replies, because it's my duty, or it contributed to the greatest happiness. Even though acceptable from the perspective of the two leading moral theories, these replies may well strike us as lacking, morally speaking, as a patient and a friend. Nor would the answer, because it's what a virtuous agent would do, be any better. Technically, because we all love technically, a moral theory is self-effacing when it's either incomplete or inconsistent, morally speaking. This being a problem because, well, who wants a theory that's either incomplete or inconsistent, right? On first reading, self-effacement is a problem for deontologists, consequentialists and virtue ethicists alike. It's worse, however, for the virtue ethicists because of the challenges of situationist psychology. Situationist psychology grew out of a methodological dispute as to whether research into the individual person or into the situation yields the best prediction and explanation of behaviour. Coming down pretty firmly on the situation side, situational psychologists claim there are no general traits internal to the person, including character traits. The relevance of this to the status of virtue ethics being that, if it's correct and there's no such thing as persistent character, virtue ethics as an account of moral good in terms of character is either inconsistent or incomplete. Inconsistent because virtue ethics would lack the persistent locus of character in which virtue as a constant moral good is supposed to dwell, and if not inconsistent by the operation of some other point of persistence, incomplete as the character would then be besides the moral point. The inevitable consequence for virtue ethics, it would seem, is self-effacement, meaning that virtue ethics fails miserably. All is not lost, however, because virtue ethics differs from its duty and consequence-based counterparts in being somewhat less dependent on the application of formal systems, such as imperative deduction or philosophic calculus, and more sensitive to the pragmatic and semantic features of day-to-day -day moral discourse, wherein it's the practical display of virtue that counts. Which is precisely why the explicit citation of a virtue, or duty, or consequence, seems suspect. Resembling the cheap forgery of a signal, rather than the expensive long-term cultivation of good character. Therefore, far from succumbing to self-effacement, as duty and consequence-based formalisms must, virtue ethics both explains it and suggests remedy. Meanwhile, situationist psychology has largely been superseded by interactionist alternatives, in which behaviour results from both personal and situational factors, and in which character traits may be activated by situational cues. And there is, as far as I can see, no in-principle reason as to why this arrangement of factors and relations could not be understood in terms of empirical theories which could in turn provide sufficient support for a consistent conception of character. So, all in all then, virtue ethics, rather than being undermined by the problem of situational self-effacement, is, especially when naturalised, uniquely well-placed to avoid it. Over the course of this series, I've responded to each and every critique of virtue ethics of which I'm aware. On the grounds of these responses, I propose that virtue ethics is a reasonable and plausible approach to moral issues, including those at the heart of many political debates. 
Indeed, I also propose that virtue ethics is superior to the duty and rights-based morality which currently seems to dominate conservative, liberal and emancipatory ideology alike, and that adopting virtue ethics instead might improve the quality of political debate in general progressive leftist politics in particular, thereby restoring its fitness for political power, which, as a progressive and a leftist, I think would be a good thing. Thank you for listening.